right, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Eastvale in the park. Great to see all the cars here today. Kenya, good morning. It's great to see everybody <clears throat> to come here this morning and celebrate the Lord in this park and uh, give thanks to the things that he's done for us and and reach out and, and just worship him in spirit and in truth. And we just thank you, Father, for all you've done for us this week as we look back and see the things that you have been involved in in our lives and how we just give you the glory and the honor that you deserve. We thank you for your grace that is new every morning, Father, as we leave our cares and worries at the foot of the cross and come to you with open hearts and open minds to hear your word and just to celebrate you this morning. So as we open up in worship, Father, we just give you the glory.
So grateful to be here in person worshiping and singing to you. Whether you're at home watching online or sitting here in a folding chair in your car, Lord, we just are so thankful for the great gift of salvation to be able to come before you. You know our hearts, you know our needs, people who are hurt, who need healing, who are sick. Just touch us, Lord. Just be with all of us and just help us to remember that ultimately you are in control and we know how this story ends, Lord Jesus. We hope that this worship is a sweet, sweet sound to your ear. And we pray in Jesus' name.
Let's open our, our service this morning. God bless you in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we look to you for our strength to face today, Lord, just as we sang right now. We ask that your spirit would fall upon us, Lord, to understand your word today. May you reveal it. May our, our minds be open to hear from you, Lord. May our ears be ready to understand your word, Lord. And may our hearts be obedient to live it out through your strength. We lift up each and every person here today, Lord, that is here in the park or online watching us, Lord, that you would minister to them. Speak to them through the worship, Lord, and through your word that you would heal their hearts that you would provide those things needed in each and every heart Lord in their lives may we look to you Lord for our strength 
our forgiveness, your mercy and grace. May we forgive others, Lord, just as you have forgiven us. May we serve you, Lord, with willing and loving hearts. May we do that which you have asked us to do with obedience, Lord. May our yokes upon us, Lord, be fitted for us, Lord. May we not take upon that which we are not able to do. We thank you, Lord, that you know us by name. We pray for those, our loved ones, Lord, that may not know you. We ask that your hand would be pulling them, that your spirit would draw them unto you today, Lord. May your kingdom grow, Lord. May we hear from you. May you watch over our children that are learning from you today, Lord, under the gazebo. May they grow in knowledge of who you are. May they accept you in their young, innocent hearts as their Lord and Savior, Lord. Grant to us now, Lord, your, your grace and your mercy as we, as we continue our worship service, Lord, in the reading and the studying of your word. We praise you and we love you. And everyone agreeing said, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to our second service. We're so glad that you're here today. And if you have your uh, app or your, our bulletin, I have a few things to mention for you. Uh, first, first of all, as you know, today is our first Sunday of the month and we normally have our communion service. But we're going to take a, a break from that today and we're going to continue, our, continue uh, our communion service next Sunday. Next Sunday, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll hold that. But you know, that's no reason for you at home if, or here as well to have communion. By all means, take communion and remember what the Lord has done for us through the sacrifice of his body and the shedding of his blood for the remissions of our sins. So take communion. Our youth are out right now and they're probably finishing up their last session they went on a retreat for if you don't know that and they'll be returning back here to the park at 12 30. so parents don't forget 12 30 they're coming back here you know or they're going to be a ward of the city so come have them come on back here i'm sure they're they're itching for an in and out or something you know a great time but you know what they're having a great time fellowshipping with all the other children, the other youth up there. We've been say, uh, getting some pictures and some videos back from them. And it looks like they're just having an enjoyable, great time. They're being blessed as well. Our children's ministry is meeting right now under the gazebo, second service. And they're going to be uh, learning about that as, uh, uh, as their own video as well. And if you haven't, parents come in and got the bag for the children. We have bags for them. We have their lessons and online as well. The, all the lessons, all their teaching, all the videos are online for you at home. So please, parents, tune in for that. This Wednesday, we'll be going into a new book. We just finished up the book of what? Ruth, that's right. Ruth, we just finished that book up story of redemption redemption our kinsman redeemer our goel boaz boaz is a type of christ that redeems his bride ruth to himself and that's what we as believers are looking forward to but this wednesday we'll be opening up a new book the book of first samuel first samuel talks about the life of david the life of david a man after god's own heart the shepherd king so Read ahead, get, get studied up, and join us at 7 o'clock Wednesday. We're going to be uh, in that new book of 1 Samuel. Monday nights, we have uh, Milton going through the Spanish study at 7 o'clock. Tuesday, the ladies are continuing in the book of James. Book of James, and they'll be online. Wednesday is our Wednesday study. And Thursday, the guys are meeting in person in, in Norco at the Martinez home. And they're going through the book of Matthew. So guys, ladies, 
Please get it plugged in throughout the week for the men, the women, the youth, everything. So those are our weekly studies. And if you uh, uh, are in need of anything, just go online and it'll tell you when they meet. If you're here in the park and you, you know that, hey, I forgot uh, 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 my uh, radio station so I can tune in or it's too cold to stay outside, tune to FM 88.5. That's the station that we broadcast to. So if you want to chill back, put your seat back, relax, turn it into 88.5, keep the windows rolled up, heater on, go ahead and do that. We'd love to have you tune in that way. We have multiple ways of tithing and, and uh, giving your offering to this church, to this ministry. One, obviously, is on the way out. We have an agape box over there. Another way is if you want to go ahead and send it in by check to the address in our app, or you can go online and give that way as well. So there's many ways to go ahead and, and uh, give your tithes and offering. You know, if, if you belong to this church, and you want to help support it, by all means. If you're new here today and you're just visiting, you know, continue to tithe to your church. Help them out. We would, we'd love to have you out here, you know, but we want you to support the church that you're being fed at, and that's biblical. So continue to do that and continue to pray for all the tithes and the offerings that are here. We're, we're, uh, we're looking to purchase some land uh, or rent a place soon. And that brings me to my, my next point that I want to make uh, a point of. Last week, you know, we, we had some horrendous winds here. I mean, the, the gusts were unbelievable. They were, they were actually being clocked at 50 and 60 miles an hour here. It had to have been at least a good steady 30 or 40 miles an hour that the wind was here. Um, it got so bad that it, it knocked over our soundboard table. And the table weighs, you know, there's about 50 pounds worth of electronics on this thing. And it toppled the whole thing over. And it was just horrible. It's dust was everywhere. But you know one thing, some of the people came in and they were anticipating church. They were anticipating church just like you people, you believers now are in the car and you're relaxed they still wanted a church service. So keep that in prayer that we can, we can meet together once again, whether it's in a building to rent, whether it's purchasing a piece of land or, or a building. But the only way we can con keep in contact with one another is through a new messaging alert system that we want to implement. So if you can take out your phones or your tablet, I just want to go through this really quick with you. And if you miss it, go back to Facebook and go ahead and look at what we're going to be doing. So if you grab your phone, take it out, and we're just going to go through this really quick. It's an alert system to say, hey, it's too windy. You know, there's rising waters like in the days of Noah. We're not going to be meeting here in the park. We want to send out a text alert to the body. So the first thing you want to do is you want to go ahead and open up for a new text. In the text to send, you want to go ahead is, and the number will be 74121 for the text. 74121. And then in the text box, you want to type poema, P-O-M, excuse me, P-O-I-E-M-A, P-O-I-E-M-A. Send it off, and in just a few seconds, you'll get a return text, and that'll be it. And you can go ahead and, if you want to uh, establish that as C.C. Eastvale. So the number to text to is, 74121, and the name will be Poema, P-O-I-E-M-A. A few moments later, you'll get a response, and then that's how we'll go ahead, and we want to keep in contact with you. We're not meeting at the park or meet at this home tonight. 
it will keep us all in contact with one another. Um, we're kind of uh, obviously scattered abroad right now and it's kind of difficult to keep in contact with one another. So that's our easiest way to do so. And along that line, we'd like to uh, start our study now. So if you have your Bibles, your tablets, Pastor Dennis is taking a few days off. He's, he and his family are, are uh, just relaxing. He, he says, uh, God bless you. Good morning he, to every, each and every one of you here today. And you know what? He actually misses coming even on vacation. He can't take a vacation. He's texting me, well, how's the things going? It's going well. He's sending me a big plate of, you know, of pancakes and potatoes, and you know, like he's really suffering right now. But he's enjoying his family, and that's what we all need to do. But you know what? He doesn't leave the pulpit to anybody. He he always leaves it in good hands, knowing that the word of God is going to be preached and glorified. So today. We have a guest speaker, our own elder Mike Weinbarger. Some of you may know him. He heads up our men's ministry. He's one of the elders here in the church. So please welcome Mike Weinbarger with me. There we go. Mike comes from a great, great couple churches, you know. He's He's been schooled by Pastor Raul Reese. He's, if anybody's been under Raul's teaching, he, my goodness, Raul is what a tremendous uh, speaker he is. He came from the high desert, Den, uh, Pastor uh, Dennis uh, Davenport, and what a great church that is as well. He and his family have been serving here faithfully for a, quite a few numbers of years, and along with their children. So, um, those are just a few things that Mike has, has, uh, has been doing. He's fully vested in this body. He prays for each and every one of you, especially the men. He, you know, guys, if, if you don't know this about Mike's heart, he, he really wants to pour into you guys, and he really would like to see you guys come on out and not necessarily say, hey, I go to the men's study, I'm sitting under Mike or anything like that. He just wants you guys to get sharpened, and not only that, but you ladies as well but mainly the men, you know, because God called the men to stand behind a pulpit and teach. Guys, you are the, the pastors and the leaders of your home. And how else do we get sharpened and know about that unless we, we, we are discussing and sharpening one another on our, just the daily issues of being a guy, you know? So with that, take out your Bibles and let's go ahead and we'll get started. Amen? <laughs> Wow, what an introduction. Um, now that you guys know everything about me, where I've been in the past 20 years. <laughs> um, Pastor Ken is so, so right. It's just a blessing to be a part of this body, to be part of this church. And me and my wife came here when they first had their first opening service in December of 2013, their grand opening. You know, I've known Pastor Dennis for over 25 years. I uh, sat under him over at Golden Springs in the college ministry uh, as a young man. I was just in my early 20s, and Dennis was a, in, his, in, his, uh, in his 20s as well, and seeing God use him, and I got to see God raise him up as a pastor and be, see him ordained and see God use him tremendously, and just, just watching and learning and just soaking in the things that my pastor was doing, how God was using him. And the one thing Dennis taught me was just be faithful. Just be available and let God do the work. Don't worry about anything. Just, just, just allow God to work through you. And I'm just so grateful for, for Pastor Dennis. So, so it's such an honor to be back behind his pulpit, pray for his family as they continue to, to rest and celebrate. And for Pastor Dennis, as he continues to give, us, give vision for this church and the direction that we may go from, from here, from this park. We're not going to be here forever. God's going to put us somewhere, but he knows exactly where we're going to be. And until then, we're going to be faithful to teach God's word right here in this park. And I'm just so, I'm so blessed to see so many of you here this morning. 
to uh, to have a desire just to hear his word, to sit at his feet, to be to be to be uh, taught his word, so we can grow, right? So we can be sharpened, so we know how to battle this world. And with that, let's pray. Let's open up our, our, our time together. Lord, we just thank you so much for this, this morning, for this time, Lord. Just be with us now. Fall upon this place, Lord, each one of us, Lord. Put a hedge about this place, Lord. Protect us. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy, Lord. Bless your word, Lord. May you speak to each one of us individually right where we're at. We're all in different places in our walks, Lord. Speak to each one of us individually, Lord. We ask you now for, for your leading right now. Give us ears to hear what your word has to say to us now. Lord, we just love you. We praise you. And we give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, guys, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. And the title of my message this morning is, Beware of this world. As Christians, we need to beware of this world. We need to watch out for this world. We need to realize that this world is something that we have to be careful of. We have to be careful of all of its influences it can have on us. It's a constant battle that we are having with what the world says is right and what we know as Christians, what the Bible says is right. You know, Paul tells us that it's a spiritual battle that we are in. Like soldiers who are, us, who are sent out to fight in a battle, to war, a spiritual war. 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4 says it like this. Paul says, you therefore must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engages in warfare, entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 2 Corinthians 10, four, verses 4 through 6 says, For the weapons of our, warf our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. And then Ephesians 6, verse 13 says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So the Bible is very clear in telling us that we are at war. We are in a spiritual battle. And the devil with this world is doing everything he can do to destroy us, to destroy you and me, to keep us from being effective for Jesus Christ. But see, one of the problems that I see, one of the things that, I, that, are, that are disheartens me is that some Christians are not seeing this world in such a way that, like, that we're in a war, that we're soldiers, that we're those soldiers on a battleship, so to speak, at the gates of hell, ready to battle this world. Instead, we see a lot of Christians today cruising around like they're on the Prince's Cruise Line, just, just going through life, not really seeing what's going on around them. As long as, long as, as long as I'm good, as long as people don't bother me, I'm fine. But God calls us to be effective Christians to be involved and engaged in spiritual warfare, to make a difference, to further his kingdom. We are not called just to hang out and dwell here. We're just passing through. God wants to use us. He wants to be glorified in us for his glory. And see, and when we live life as such, the world has a way of lulling us to sleep spiritually. We don't, we're not engaged. We're disengaged. So the question is, how do we deal with this world? Because even though our spirit is redeemed, our bodies are not. They will one day. We will get a new body. But until then, we deal with this body. We deal with this flesh. Because our body appetites, our flesh loves the things of this world and what it has to offer. It's entertainment, it's music, it's desires, it's pleasures. Hawaii and all its beauty, right? If I, could just, if I could just go there and 
relax and get away from this world. Our body desires those things. Just look at all the commercials that are, that are thrown at us as we're, as we're watching television or whatever. The things that they put out. You got to have this type of car. You got to have this, this outfit. You got to go to this place and experience this. Like I said, at first, I remember sitting with my son and we're watching uh, television together and the commercial comes on and it's a Carl's Jr. commercial. And it's a half-naked lady uh, eating a hamburger provocatively. And I'm, I'm sitting with my eight-year-old son and I'm going, I can't grab the remote fast enough to turn that, to turn that channel. Trying to, trying to appeal to the men. Apparently, they'll, apparently, guys will buy a hamburger if we see a beautiful girl eating it in front of us. I don't know. But we see that, that's, that the world and what, and what it's trying to do. It's trying to appeal to this body, to our flesh. And because our body is yet to be redeemed, like I said, our desires to please our bodies can sometimes get in the way of being all that God wants us to be. So how do we keep this body in check? Well, here in chapter 12 of Romans, Paul is going to give us some, some ways we need to live that will help us to be all that God desires us to be. Because Paul was dealing with Roman culture back then. He was dealing with the same things we deal here in American culture. Roman culture was just as evil back then as, it is, as American culture is today. Just as loss. So we're going to go through chapter 12 here. We're going to go through the first two verses. And we're going to see some of those little nuggets that God has for us to help us to, to, to deal with this world. How do we deal with this world? What do we need to do? Let's go ahead and read verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Let me stop right there. So the first thing we read here is Paul uses the word beseech. Now the Greek for, word for beseech is perikaleo, and it means to urge or beg, but also it, it carries a connotation of coming alongside to help, to comfort, to encourage. And Paul wants the people to know not only is he urging them, but he also desires to come alongside them, to help them to comfort them as they go out and battle Roman culture. Now, what's interesting about this Greek word perikaleo is the same root word that Jesus used in John 14, 16 for the Holy Spirit. That word being the perikalitos. What Jesus was saying is that the helper, the Holy Spirit will come alongside us as believers to do the same thing, to help us to comfort us, to lead us and guide us toward the things of God. Just an amazing word. Other biblical writings also use this word perikaleo for a commanding officer who is about to give the troops encouragement before going out to battle, before going out to war. And see, as an ex-army vet, I can understand, I can relate to such language. Being encouraged, being comforted, before going out to the battle. So here's Paul saying, as a spiritual commander, I want to encourage you as you go out to face Roman culture. I want to help you. I want to come alongside you to guide you spiritually as you lead the four walls of your, of your home. As we lead the four walls of our home, the Holy Spirit comes alongside us to guide us as we engage this world. Because Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Brethren lets us know he's speaking to believers. He's speaking to you and me. And see, what, Paul's about to, what Paul is about to encourage them in, only believers can do. Only believers can engage in spiritual warfare. A non-believer cannot engage in spiritual warfare. They are of the world. They're part of the world. Right? Right? And also, if you notice, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. That's another indicator that he's talking to believers and not the world. Because as believers, we recognize that we are saved by God's mercy. 
that because of what Christ did on the cross for us, we get mercy. We don't get what we deserve. Mercy is getting what you deserve. And God, Christ, took that, that pain, that penalty, so we wouldn't have to take on that, that death. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So Paul is speaking to me and you. He's speaking to believers. And what is the first thing we should do? We should present our bodies as a living sacrifice. See, we need to present our bodies. The word present here in the Greek is peristemi. It's a word that was used to describe how the priests in the Old Testament would place the sacrifice on the altar, giving us a picture of total surrender, of giving up, as that sacrifice was put on the altar. So Paul is telling us that we should, we should in the same way surrender our bodies as a sacrifice on that altar. Why? Because our bodies have been touched by sin in a very big way, in a very big, big way. Sin has corrupted our bodies. In such a way, when unchecked, it can do a lot of harm. It can do a lot of damage, especially to our, our wives, our husbands, our children, our grandchildren. And that's why our bodies need to be placed on the altar. Paul is telling us that our bodies have a way of getting in the way because of this thing called sin. Paul even describes, talks about it himself in uh, Romans 7, verses 18 and 19, when he says, I know that in me, that's my flesh, nothing good dwells. Paul talks about it. And then he goes on to say, for the good I want to do, I, I cannot do. But the evil I don't want to do, I do. I don't know about you, but I can relate to that. Totally. Then down in verse 24, the same chapter, he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So Paul understands. He, he can relate to us. Paul was a was a great man of God, wrote most of the, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But he himself recognized that this body can get in the way of what God wants, what God desires for us. And Paul talks about this body. He gives us a description, actually, a more graphic detail how our bodies have been corrupted by sin in a devastating way. Romans 3, verses 13 to 18, you can just write it down, I'll read it for you. He describes our body like this. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are their ways. In the way of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Wow. A really graphic detail of our bodies when they're not put on that altar. A really graphic detail. And I don't know about you, but I see how our bodies have been corrupted just by how Paul talks about it. And if you can't see that, let me bring it a little bit closer to home. Let me put it in practical terms for you. Here's a question we can ask ourselves, right? Has our throats been an open tomb? Meaning, have we been speaking words that bring death to our children and to our spouse by how we put them down instead of picking them up and edifying them? Always constantly putting down. Always pointing out to, to them what they're not doing right. Or has our tongues been practicing deceit? Maybe we find ourselves telling a little white lies or half-truths, skirting around the truth sometimes. You know, it's tax time, right? It's that time. Sometimes we, uh, we, we, we can uh, want to get back at Uncle Sam for what he's taken all year long, right? And maybe we screw around the truth. We don't, we, we're not totally honest when it comes to doing things. I don't know. Or, or maybe ASP is under our lips when, when all you do is go around poisoning your coworkers, putting them down to other coworkers. Or maybe go around constantly complaining about your boss to your coworkers, putting him or her down. And, you're, and we're Christians. We're not, we're not supposed to be doing those things. 
But even worse, I've seen Christians going around to other church members in the body complaining about the pastor to one another. Asp under our lips. Poison. Or maybe your mouth has been full of cursing. You, you'd be surprised how many Christians use profanity. I've, I've seen men call their wives the B word. Just unbelievable. And then, you know, or, or on the way to church, yelling at their children, yelling, yelling at everybody, getting upset. And then when they pull up to church, they see a brother. Hey, how you doing? Oh, praise the Lord, brother. Good to see you. Like, total change. And I know what happened because I've been there when I was a young Christian. Getting upset, getting impatient, not, things not going right. Why you turn this way? Turn, you know. And then when you get to church, you act like nothing's happened. Ask under our lips. Or has our feet been swift to shed blood? Meaning, has your feet been going places it shouldn't be? Or whether the fear of God is before your eyes. Do you have the fear of God when you watch TV, when you watch certain movies, certain television programs? When you see things on there that, that you didn't, maybe you didn't realize was going to be, and then you see it, do you turn it off and move on, or do you continue to watch those things and feed the body what it wants? Because the fear of God will govern what we watch. And when I say fear, I mean reverence, respect, understanding that the Holy Spirit lives in us. It sees what we see. We can't check it at the door when we go into a movie theater about to see something we shouldn't see. Taking God's money, buying things we shouldn't buy, or, or see, seeing things we shouldn't see. Just things that, that we should ask ourselves. Questions about this body. The things that we see. See, as, as we bring things closer to home, these things can be some real heart-penetrating questions for us that we need to ask ourselves. And when we examine ourselves against these questions, we can see how we need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, as Paul is saying here. So the question is, what part of our body, what part of your body, what part of my body needs to get on the altar first? Is it what you're seeing when nobody's around? On your phone, guys? When your wife's asleep? On that computer when nobody's watching? Is it your feet because you're going places you shouldn't be? Is it your tongue, your mouth? Because if you, know, if you notice, most of the things that Paul mentioned there dealt with our tongues. You know, that tongue weighs about eight ounces, but it surely has a way of really get us, getting us in trouble. James said our tongues have a direct pipeline to hell if we don't watch what we speak, if we don't put it under wraps. James 3.6 so we see how our bodies need to be on the altar because they surely have been corrupted. Our bodies surely have sin to deal with. The flesh has been corrupted. Our spirits are redeemed, but our bodies have not yet been. But if you notice, Paul said for us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. I'm so glad he said that. A living sacrifice. Because a living sacrifice can get on and off the altar before the Lord. A dead one is just dead. Nothing, nothing there. Now, in the Old Testament, the priest would offer a dead sacrifice. And it was graphic where a person would come with their lamb, right? And they would place their hand on the lamb, symbolizing the transfer of sins to that lamb. And the priest would take that lamb and slit his throat, causing it to bleed on the altar. That, that, that shedding of blood would represent the shedding and the forgiveness of our sins. Just a, just a really graphic scene when you think about it. But Paul is telling us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Remember, to present refers to complete surrender on that altar of giving up as a living sacrifice because only a living sacrifice can make a difference to those around us. Only a living sacrifice can make a, can make a change in others around us in our homes, in our, in our uh, jobs, in our neighborhoods. A dead one is just that, dead. And see, 
We have two examples of living sacrifices in the Bible. Remember, remember Abraham and Isaac? When God told Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, the promised son, and I want you to take him up to the mountain. And I want you to sacrifice him. So here, here's Abraham. He takes his son up to the mountain, right? And they get up there, and you can, you can, you can, picture, you can picture it. They're up there. After a nice walk, they're up there. And Isaac tells his father, okay, dad, I, I see the wood. I see the, the ropes. I see the lighter in your hand, the, the matches or whatever. And I see we have everything for the sacrifice, but I don't see the animal. I don't see the lamb. Where is that? And Abraham tells him, you're it, son. You're that sacrifice. And I don't know about you, but I would have ran out of there. I don't think so. I don't think I want to be the sacrifice today, pops. At that time, um, Isaac was 33 years old, about. And you know, Isaac could have overtooken his father easily, easily, and, and ran out of there. But what did, he, what did Isaac do? He surrendered. He willingly went on that altar. If we know the rest of the story, as Abraham's about to sacrifice him, the angel stops him. But I say that to say this. It pointed, it points to a a beautiful picture, the ultimate living sacrifice, Jesus Christ, who freely laid down his life, who freely surrendered his life for you and for me. Jesus said in John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself freely, freely. He took our place on Calvary's cross. He took our sin and did so because of his love for you and for me. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. Wow. Jesus, like I said, Jesus saw you and me when he died on that cross. It's what drove him to that cross. What drove him to be completely surrendered over to die for, for me and you. He saw, he saw his friend. He wanted to see, he wants to see you with him in heaven one day, in eternity. Just an amazing act of, un of unconditional love that Jesus displayed for me and you. So Jesus is the ultimate living sacrifice. Holy. It was holy and acceptable to God. God the Father. And like Jesus, our sacrifice needs to be holy. Now that Greek word is hagios, and it means to be set apart for a particular purpose. And like the lamb in the Old Testament, how it had to be holy or without blemish, which pointed to Jesus, the perfect lamb who had no sin, it meant that we need to be holy and without blemish as well. Not sinless. No, well, we can't be sinless, but we can be holy. We can be set apart. We can make it our aim to be set apart in order to be able to enter into the presence of God. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4 says it like this. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Men, you can only take your family and the young men in your life and your children as far as you've gone. Ladies, you can only take your children and the young ladies in your life and your family as far as you've gone. See, we can't take those under us into the presence of God if we ourselves have not been there, if we have not gone there ourselves. We have to be set apart before God so he can use us to make a difference in this world, in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. And see, God wants to use us for his glory, but, we're, but are we being set apart? Are we a vessel of honor, useful for the master, as 2 Timothy 2 tells us? So it says, I beseech you therefore, my brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. See, we need to be holy because only a holy sacrifice is acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. Our reasonable service, 
That word reasonable is logikos, where we get our English word logic, and it means that which belongs to reason or logic. It means that in light of all that the Lord has done for us when it comes to our, fa- our salvation, which Paul talks about in, verse, in chapters 1 through 11. Paul talks about all the things God has done for us, all, of, all the things he's done for, for us when it comes to our salvation. And now here in chapter 12, he talks about because of that, it's only our reasonable service. It's only logical. It's only reasonable. It's our reasonable service. Now that word service is in the Greek word is latiera, and it means service of any kind. But this word was also used in the Old Testament to describe worship prescribed to the Levitical ceremonies. In other words, the priestly service was a part of the Old Testament worship. So this tells us that our service to God needs to be an extension of our worship to Him. See, worship isn't just, isn't just singing songs before the message is, is being presented. It's a lifestyle. It's how we think. It's how we make decisions. It's how we speak. That word worship in the Greek is proskuneo, and it means to turn and kiss to adore. And see, as we worship, we are turning and kissing him for all that he has done for us. We are exposing ourselves completely to him to do whatever he chooses. And see, when we truly worship him and are completely open to him, he'll expose some things to us. He'll expose some hidden things in our hearts that we don't realize is there. Errors in our lives. Because the Bible says, he is light and in him is no darkness. That's why worship before getting into the world is so important. So important. That as we worship, as we, as we completely open ourselves to him, he's, he's showing us things in our heart. He's showing those dark areas in our heart that we, need to be, that we need, need to deal with. Maybe we've got an argument with our spouse before coming here. And maybe we, we said some things we shouldn't have said, we didn't mean to say. God will show you those things. Or, or maybe we talk to our children in a certain way that we shouldn't have. God will show us those things. Or maybe there's bitterness in our hearts. We're angry at somebody because they've wronged us. And we're holding on to it. God wants to show you to let it go so you can freely worship me without any distraction, without anything in your heart. He wants all of us. He wants all our hearts. Not just some of it, not just part of it, but all of it. All of it. And see, worship is a time in which we can get our hearts right with God, like I said, because when we do, that our hearts will be able to receive what God has to say through his word. Right? When, we have our, when our hearts are right, God can speak to us through our word. And see, when we neglect worship and only the word, you're only having a monologue, not a dialogue. A monologue is one way. It's a one-way street, but a dialogue is two-way street. See, worship is us talking with God, and the word is God talking to us. When we're just content to having a monologue where we don't feel worship is important, I just, I just got to get that word. The word is all I got to have. And when, we, and when we neglect worship, where God wants to deal with things in our hearts, the word can't penetrate. We've we're, we're got, we got things in there that God wants, wants us to deal with. Because a monologue can be religion, where a dialogue is a relationship. It's two, it's, it's, it's two people sharing their hearts with one another. God's heart, sharing his heart with us. So worship is our reasonable service. So it should be said like this. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. I love that. As we are presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him, it'll be reasonable our acts will, will be an acts of worship which are reasonable, logical, because of all that he's done for us. But what else does Paul tell us? Let's look at verse 2. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. I love that. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that that word and, it's a conjunction, right? I mean, it's going to connect what he just said to what he's about to say. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and while you're at it, do not be conformed to this world. Now, that word conformed in the Greek is sukametio, and it's where we get our English word schematic. It means to conform oneself to a prescribed pattern or scheme, to masquerade as a different person. See, the world is a, the, the, this, see, this world is a verb and it's passive, meaning it's something that, is, that we are allowing to be done to us. That's why Paul says, be not conformed to this world, meaning we are not to masquerade as a person of this world. We are to be set apart. We are to be different, not to be conformed. I like, I like the J.B. Phillips translation. It says, it says it even better. Don't let this world squeeze you into its mold. And see, that's what the world is trying to do. It squeezes into its mold. See, squeezing speaks of pressure. And we are constantly pressured to see things the world's way. Tr trying to pressure us. And, you know, and it's made its way into the church, unfortunately where we see believers are angry on social media toward one another. See, the world, the, and, and just bad-mouthing one another. See, the world, that's what the world does. They're blinded. They don't see the things of God and how we should act toward each other. If we disagree on something, pray for one another. Lift up one another. Because we allow this world to squeeze us into its mold, the way it thinks, the way it acts instead of just praying. Or well, when the world tells us that, the, that gender is wrong, we know that's been a big hot topic, you know, and that we don't need to see each other as men and women created by God, right? Then you hear, then, you know, then you hear of a church. I, I remember hearing about a church who said, the pastor said, we're not going to say happy Father's Day or happy Mother's Day here because we don't want to offend the single parents of this, of our congregation. I said, are you kidding me? No. Ladies, I don't care how good, single ladies, I don't care how good of a mother and father you need to be in that child's life. Only a father can be a, a father to that child. Men, same thing. I don't care how good you may think you are as a, a, as a man, as a mother and father, which you're probably doing a great job, but only a mother, a, a woman can be a mother to that child. God created us male and female for a reason. We have differences, but the world is trying to squeeze us into their mold to see things their way. But the word squeezing, uh, but, but so how do we keep from being conformed to this world? Well, Paul tells us in that same verse, by being transformed, being transformed. That word transform is metamorphio. It's where we get our word, English word metamorphosis. It speaks of that process a caliper goes through to become a butterfly. Just an awesome picture of what we were before we, became, we came to Christ, right? A bug, a worm, right? But because God loves us so much, he, he, he desires to transform us into a beautiful butterfly. Beautiful in different colors. Able to fly, able to soar. Whereas before, we were just a bug, a worm, crawling in the dirt, right? The dirt of sin. But then Jesus came along and died in our place. And the Bible says we are now clothed with the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us. And because we are, this is where we truly receive our beauty as Christians. It's not your nice skin color, ladies. It's not your beautiful hair. Men, it's, it's not your swag. It's not the way you look outwardly. It's because we are clothed with the robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what people want to see. They don't want to see you. They want to see Jesus. 
God wants to see Jesus. We are, we are to be pictures, reflections of him, of who he is. See, God calls us, calls us his workmanship in Ephesians 2.10, his poem, his trophy that he wants us to be displayed. And the only way he can show us off to this world to see is if we are going through a metamorphosis, that we're being transformed. A metamorphosis is where people no longer see us, they see Jesus. Like I said, being reflected through you and through me. We don't want people to see us. We want them to see Jesus. That's how he's glorified. But as we continue on and wind down, I want you guys to notice that Paul tells us that the, the location where this transformation needs to happen first. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the first place we need to be transformed is our mind, our mind. We need to be transformed in our minds, the way we think about what is right and wrong when it comes to God's will for our lives. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The mind is, the mind is where we need to get rebooted, restarted, refreshed, reprogrammed, because this world is constantly telling us what is right and what is wrong. But it's, it's the word. It's, it's, that's where we find the guidance and the direction for God's will in our lives. What, what is right and what's wrong. We need the word of God to be hidden in our hearts so we can be transformed. David said it this way, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Colossians 1 20 says, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, the Word of God. So it's, it's to the teaching of the Word of God is how our minds are transformed. As we are sitting here together, hearing God's Word, that our minds are being renewed, being transformed. If you remember the, the psalmist, uh, Asaph in Psalm 73 when he said his foot almost slipped when he saw the prosperous the prosperity of the wicked but then he said when I went into the sanctuary I saw their end see it's in the sanctuary where we see things from God's perspective no longer we no longer stay it's when we stay out of the sanctuary it's when we can be like Asa. We can almost slip. We can see the wicked and, and say, why are they so prosperous? Here I am serving God, going to church faithfully, and I can't even find a job. I can't make the rent. It's not fair. And that's why we need to be in the sanctuary where God's word is being taught. So we can see things from God's perspective. It renews our thinking. It renews our minds. And depending on how much and how often we are in, it will depend how much God can use us to affect others around us. To affect our, our, our families, our children, our wives, our husbands. Because when we don't, When we're not in the Word, because we don't, we can be deceived. James says it like this. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. See, we just sit and hear only, and Satan doesn't have to deceive us. We are deceiving ourselves. See, when Pastor Dennis comes, right, every... Wednesday and every s Sunday morning, and he's, he's giving us the Word of God, and he's, he's giving us a feast, the feast of the Word. And it's like being in an, an all-you-can-eat buffet for, for some of us. You know how it is. You guys know how it is when you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet where, you know, you, you pay your money, and you go, man, I, I got to get my money's worth. I'm, I'm going to get like three or four plates, maybe more. We'll, we'll, I don't know. We'll see, but it's all you can eat. And some of you guys take it literally, all you can eat. <laughs> right? And afterwards, they're carrying you out. They're rolling you out because you, you've eaten so much. 
But that's how it can be for us spiritually as well. As, as, as pastor, as we hear the word and we're just getting fed and we're just becoming spiritually fat. Let me just say it like that. Spiritually. And we're overweight and we're just, we're just, we can't move. We're sitting in our chair and we can't move. We're not, we're not being doers. We're being hearers only. Right? And we need to Work it off. The same way if, 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 if you're out there and you're, and you're, you're going to the buffets, you know, you know you need to go to the gym and work it off, right? You, 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 need, to, you need to go to the gym because if you don't, it's going to sit there. But the same way for us spiritually, as we hear God's word, as, we, as we're getting fed, we need to work it off in God's gym. We need to be out there serving others, looking at others more highly than ourselves, looking to, to further God's kingdom, not our kingdom, we're just passing through. We're sojourners. This is not our home. Everything around you is, is going to burn. It's, it's all a facade. Our true home is with him. And he's got so much more waiting for us. The Bible says, no, no eye has seen or ears have heard. A man can understand what God has laid out for us. We just get, but like I said, this body, it desires the things of this world. We have to be men and women of the word that both hear it and do it. Why? So those under us, around us, can see our examples and be stirred up toward good works. Our wives, our children, our family members, especially one another. Remember, we can, we can only take them so far as we've gone. And finally, when we are being a holy, living sacrifice to God, being men and women of the word, having our minds renewed, it's then we can find what the last part of verse 2 says. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. See, if we're presenting our bodies and we are living holy and being acceptable before God, we don't have to worry about to go right or go left. God will put it in our hearts, his desires. We are no longer living for our desires. This body is no longer uh, being the one telling me what to do. Now it's the spirit of God. God putting in us his desires, his will for our lives. As we are living as a living sacrifice, as, le as, as we are being completely surrendered over to him, being set apart, you know, in the Old Testament, they had the, they had the, they had the temple, and they had these instruments, and they were set apart. Nobody can use them but the priests. And in the same way, God wants to use us as instruments, holy and acceptable, set apart for the master so we can use us to further this kingdom. There's people dying every day in this country who don't know Christ. If you're a Christian and you don't have a heart for the lost, something's wrong. Because that's God's heart. God says, I am willing that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. God desires to see each and one of us with him in heaven. So we need to be men and women of the word because we can only take those around us, those under us, as far as we've gone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much just for this time for your word, just for the encouragement that your word has for us, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, if there's anybody out there, Lord, who's are struggling with anything in their lives, that they need to put something on the altar before you, their eyes, their feet, their tongue, whatever it may be, Lord, you know what that is. I just pray for them right now, Lord, that they would surrender that to you. No condemnation restoration. God, you desire restoration so we can be useful for the master. And if you're out there and maybe you're not a Christian, maybe you're of this world and you don't, you don't know Christ, I want to give you an opportunity right now to accept him as your Lord and Savior because he died for you too. He saw you on that cross. He wants to call you his friend. So if you're out there, you're on Facebook, and you want to give your life to the Lord, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. 
Make this your own prayer. Pray this after me. Dear Jesus, please forgive me for all of my sins. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live for you and be used by you in a greater way. I love you and I thank you for dying for me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you're here, speak to one of me. To one of us, myself, Pastor Ken, or one of the elders, we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll put a Bible in your hand. We'll pray with you. We'll give you things to encourage you in your walk. And just, just know that God loves you and he's, he's for you. He's not against you. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and close our, close our service. Dear Lord, we thank you once again just for this time. We thank you for this time of, of just sitting at your feet and uh, hearing what you have to say to us, Lord. Bless your people as they leave here, Lord. And uh, give them traveling mercies back to their homes, Lord. Continue to use and guide them, Lord, and direct them. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. God bless. Great week.